Well, a very warm welcome to Vintage Online. Great to have you with us this Sunday. We're on week four of our series in the Gospel of Matthew. We're about to step into Sermon on the Mount and our very own Kathleen Doyle is going to come and bring a message to us. So we're looking forward to that. In a moment, we're going to worship and open the scriptures. But before that, let me pray for us as we begin our service. Just invite you to take a moment wherever you are, whether you're with family, whether you're with friends, by yourself, just take a moment to sit. Let's pray and prepare and invite the Lord into our service. Father, we thank you that we get the opportunity to open scripture together. We thank you for all that you're doing in us and to us and through us at this time. And we pray, Lord, that you would use this service to speak to us. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm reading from Psalm chapter 111, uh, verses 1 through 4. Great are the Lord's works. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright in his congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And now we worship.
you higher You are the only king forever Forevermore You are victorious You are the only king forever Almighty God we lift you higher You are the only king forever Forevermore You are victorious Hi Vintage, I'm Ted. Will you join me now in prayer and intercession? The Bible is so full of great intercessors like Isaiah and Jeremiah and King David, and no one was greater than Jesus himself who prayed for us and to whom we pray in his name. So let's begin by thanking God himself for being our king, for being our provider, and for working in and through us even and especially during the most difficult circumstances. So will you join me now in this prayer of thanksgiving. Secondly, let's lift up all of those who have been impacted by and are affected with COVID-19, including the President of the United States and the First Lady and those around them, those in hospitals, those who are unwell, and those financially impacted by COVID-19. Let's pray for healing and restoration and provision. Let's lift up all of those in education, the college students who face uncertain futures and difficult choices, the students and their parents and families at home trying to navigate distance learning and online learning, and all of the teachers who are undergoing so much transition right now. Let's pray for courage and wisdom and provision. This has Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, first and foremost, for who you are, for being a good and generous God, for being our King, for being our provider, for working in and through us to further your kingdom. We lift up all of those who have been impacted by COVID-19, the President, the First Lady, those around them, those in hospitals, those who are unwell, those financially impacted, and we pray for healing and restoration and provision. 
and we lift up all of those in education, the college students, the students at home, their parents and their families, and the teachers, and we pray for courage and wisdom and provision. In all of those things, we pray in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to be with you, Vintage. We are continuing our series in Matthew, and we are looking at Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And there's a lot of information in here, a lot of passages in here that you're going to be really familiar with, it. but I'm not going to try to cover two full chapters. What I want to do is do a big picture overview and then zero in on one particular principle. But as you've heard before, as Gare shared with you, the whole book of Matthew is designed to speak to a Hebrew audience, and it does a lot of references to the Old Testament. It's really important to Matthew that his audience understand that this is a fulfillment of promises and prophecies that have been alive and they've been waiting for and anticipating for a long time. And so this particular part of Matthew is a continuation of that. And so what we want to look at is what was the purpose of this Sermon on, of, on the Mount and what was Jesus trying to accomplish? So if we go back to the Old Testament, one of the fulfillments here comes out of Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31. And so I just want to read that really quickly. Jeremiah is reminding Israel what's coming. He says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with my ancestors when I took them by the hand and I led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife. But this is a new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And so this is the beginning of the fulfillment of that. And part of Jesus' role is he's fulfilling the original covenant that God had with Abraham. You're going to be my people. You will. I will always be with you, and you will... Uh, kind of go out and fill the earth with your presence. He's also fulfilling the new Moses promise that there would be one who's gonna be even greater than Moses. So when Jesus shows up, he is bringing them up to a mount or a mountain, just like Moses went up to the mountain in Mount Sinai and he brought down the 10 commandments. And so what Jesus is doing is he's saying, here is the beginning of the new instruction. It's not really new, but it's deeper and richer. This is the fulfillment of what you've been told is coming. And so on the Sermon of the Mount, what you see is Jesus beginning to take some of the Ten Commandments and explain them in deeper and richer ways. But he starts it off with the Beatitudes, the blessings that he has for um, who he describes as blessed in God's kingdom. And what's interesting, I just learned this myself recently, um, and so I want to share it with you. There's a guy named Tim Mackey. He's a pastor. He runs the Bible Project. He is just fascinating. He is so good at bridging the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what he did is he dug up some research, and he found out that part of the Beatitudes is actually a reference to another teaching. There was a popular teaching by a gentleman, his, and he wrote, he had some uh, probably oral literature that was called The Wisdom of Ben Sira, The Wisdom of B-E-N-S-I-R-A, if you ever want to look that up. And what he had was very popular teaching of nine blessings. And those teachings appear to have almost lived parallel with scripture. But there were some trouble, there were some problems and some trouble with those teachings. Because part of what Ben Sira was saying is if you are blessed, you are somebody who can rejoice in your children. You will also live to see the downfall of your foes. You will have a sensible wife who doesn't do foolish things. Um, you will not serve someone who is inferior to you. And so I won't go into all of it, but in these blessings, what people began to really adopt is this idea that if God is really with you, and if he's really blessing you, you're gonna have this superiority, you're not gonna have any trouble, and um, you're gonna be able to kind of look down on other people, and that was absolutely not biblically sound. And so what you see is Jesus showing up and saying, actually, I'm gonna push back on that. So if we look at Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse one, the crowd is following him. It says, one day he saw the crowds gathering and Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down and his disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. 
says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what God is saying and what Jesus is saying in this moment is, you're not blessed because the evidence of your blessing isn't that you are somehow superior to other people. Whether you're poor in spirit, whether you're sick, whether you're mourning, whether you're grieving, you're blessed because the kingdom of God is present. It levels the playing field. And it says everyone who is created is in, uh, capable of and able to receive God's full blessing just because they're made in His image. And so what you see in this crowd are people who are both poor and sick and suffering. You see people who probably don't have any of those issues, but they're seeking righteousness. They're trying to find out the truth. They're listening to Jesus' teaching. And what Jesus is saying is when the kingdom shows up, when you follow my ways, you will be blessed. And he goes on to say, from that position of being mine, you will be salt to the earth in a place that's decaying, in a place that's tasteless. As you follow me, you're gonna be bringing life back. You're gonna be preserving things. You're gonna be bringing um, some sort of flavor to this place. You'll be a city on a hill where things are dark. As you seek me and you follow me, you will be the light. And one of the most important things in this passage, and you're gonna read this word over and over and over again, is this idea of righteousness. And it's not a sexy word, it's not a word that we use very often, but it's a word that is so important in this particular passage. What I've had to kind of get over some of my own hurdles of what I thought righteousness was. I thought righteousness was being perfect and keeping the rules and um, following certain protocols. But really the way that this word is used and where you see it is in five, Matthew 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. In this passage, it says justice, but it also can translate righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And what that term righteousness means is it's actually a relational term. It's not just about fulfilling rules. It's not just about following certain protocols or certain um, standards. What righteousness means in this particular passage is doing right by others. It means showing up and treating other people well. It means showing up and honoring and respecting and giving dignity to the idea that God has made each one of us in His image. And part of fulfilling the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself, is to seek righteousness and ask ourselves, ask ourselves, how do I do right by another person? What does that look like? And I have a little bit of a silly example, but I remember as I first became a Christian, um, I was in college and I did not grow up in a Christian home. And we were going through a Bible study. I was in a parachurch ministry. And we were learning this phrase. It was called practicing the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. But basically what it meant is whatever you're doing in life, just live as if the Lord is there and, and let that help shape the way you treat people and shape the way you behave, etc. And so I was learning to do that. This is such a bad example. But um, at the time, I was in a serious dating relationship, and the guy I was dating was at another college, and I'm a, kind of a new believer, so got me some slack. And, um, and I remember, as we're going through this practicing the presence conversation, I kind of made a joke with my girlfriends that when I was in group settings, especially if there were guys around in that group setting, I was going to practice the presence of Rob. And that was his name. And so what that meant was I was going to live like he was there. I was going to live as if he was in the room with me, that I wouldn't treat a, a guy any differently if he was sitting there next to me, as if he wasn't sitting there next to me, that, that no matter what, I wanted to make sure that I conducted myself with integrity. Because I remember watching people when you're away at college, you know, everyone's flirting, everybody's single, that's all the stuff that's happening. Um, but you'd see people behave one way and then their boyfriend or girlfriend would come in 
to visit and you'd see a totally different person. And I remember there was a little bit of ickiness around that. There was a little bit of yuck behind that. And it, and it challenged me to say, I don't want to be like that and I don't want to do that. And in this idea of practicing the presence of God or, or really thinking through our righteousness, what we're trying to look at is being congruent. I'm not one person in one scenario and another person in another scenario. I'm not just kind to you when you're in my face. I'm not just treating you well when I have some accountability because your presence present, I treat you well when you're not around. And in our particular community here in Santa Monica, and we've got a lot of single people and we've got a lot of dating going on, and I don't know how any of you are navigating that online dating thing, but I'm just challenging us, what would it look like to approach an area of life like that with this idea of righteousness? What does it look like to do right by people? What does it look like to treat people well? Not because you're gonna get caught or not caught, not because you can get away with it or not get away with it, but because you're gonna be salt in the earth. You're gonna be a city on the hill. You're gonna to begin to reflect the things that God has for you. Because what we see later in this whole theme of righteousness sticks through this whole passage, is later on what we see in Matthew chapter six, verse 33, is this idea as people are pursuing the things of the world, food, you know, um, clothing, image, etc. What he says is, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And so there's a call in this passage, not just to live out rules, but there's a call to deeply believe that God is real, that he has called us to treat people righteously, do right by them. It matters to him. He sees that. And that in seeing that, um, he's promising us, I've got you. Just do it my way. Trust me and let me lead you and let me instruct you. Because the truth is his instructions are so good. They are things that keep us from embarrassing ourselves and others, harming people, getting ourselves into a whole lot of pain and getting off track. And um, what you see in the, the writings of Ben Sira is just this idea of pursue the world, pursue your position, pursue your personal glory, make sure you look good, make sure you're on top, make sure you're a winner. And in doing that, you will be happy. But what we know from so many experiences in life, passages in the Bible is, it really is the pride that comes before the fall. Once we get to a place where our main focus is only my own well-being, my capacity to mistreat people goes up exponentially. My ability to lie, my ability to mistreat, my ability to exploit will begin to go through the roof. And what the Lord is calling us to is to get more grounded in the truth, that the blessing comes from seeking Him first, that that is where we start to build our foundation. And in that passage of Matthew 6, 33, we really are called to seek. What that means is we pursue His kingdom. We pursue His righteousness. We're intentional about it. We go after it. We make it a priority. And then we build our life from there. We don't start with sort of superficial goals or selfish ambition and then include God somewhere along the way. What we're really called to do in this passage is really make Him the foundation of what we're about and what we believe and let Him take it from there. Um, it's interesting, there's a retreat center here in Malibu and I go to it, I've been to it several dozen times. Um, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful location, it's a great place to worship the Lord and be with Him. But something I've noticed every time I go is it's in Malibu, I love Malibu, but there is always construction noise going on, always. Someone is always tearing down a house and rebuilding a house out there, and you know, I, it would be nice. Um, but it's just noisy. And so this retreat center that's designed to be this place of rest is, is a place that can be a little bit noisy before three o'clock. Um, and something that struck me one time as I was sitting out there is, is I was looking at creation and the effortless nature that God was, be, was able um, to have in creating everything that we see. It's effortless. It was with a breath that the sea that I'm looking at, the ocean that I'm looking at, the trees that I'm looking at, the sky, the universe, this was something that He could do with no effort, making us everything in creation. 
and I look at the laboring and how long it takes. Some of those homes have been in the process of being built for years and they're gonna be spectacular. And by all means, we wanna take our talents and our skills and create things on this earth. There's nothing wrong with that. But when I look at the effort it takes to build something, the mess, sometimes the complication, and I contrast that with God who's saying, just seek me first. I've got it all. There's nothing I'm gonna withhold from you. There's, there's also, this is a passage where he says, if your kid asks for a loaf of bread, are you gonna give him a stone? You know, no, if he asks for a fish, are you gonna give him a snake? No, the, God is saying, put me first. Seek me, seek my kingdom, and do right by others, and let me take care of the rest. Because what he tells us is when we fail to do that, when we fail to listen to his instruction and trust him and go after it, what we do is we end up being people who, it's almost like we built our house on the sand. So if we read in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on a bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished these, saying these things, the crowd were, was amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike any of their teachers of the religious law. So we see him fulfilling this new Moses and this new teacher. And what he's saying is, um, don't neglect this. Don't take this for granted. This instruction is life-giving. When he goes back to the Old Testament, he'll remind us the Old Testament or the, the Ten Commandments will say, don't murder. He's saying, I'm saying, don't even hate someone in your heart. The Old Testament, the commandment will be, don't commit adultery. I'm saying, don't even indulge yourself in lust. Do right by people. Treat people like they're created in my image. And let me take care of the rest. And so part of what I'm hoping as we wrap this up is just that we would really embrace uh, the love behind God's instruction, uh, the good counsel in his word, and that we would seek his righteousness. Lord, tell me what does it look like to do right by you and by others? What does it look like to lay down the temptation to cheat or steal or lie or mistreat or be hypocritical? And what does it look like to pick up your way and trust you that you've got a good plan that is a good foundation on which to live my life, and you know where you're taking me with that. And as I follow you, I get the opportunity to be the salt, to be the light in a world that's really struggling. So a couple things that we wanna call you to in this idea of seeking um, is just if you're not connected to anything else right now, and you look on Vintage's website, you'll see that there's opportunities to get invo involved in different courses. One of them right now, Bill Doctrum, he's a friend of mine, he is fantastic, is finishing up a series on James. If you go online, you can still register for that. Um, it's a small fee and you'll have access to all the previous videos and it is incredible and great instruction on how to live out of the, the instruction from the book of James. There's also courses and there are community groups. That's a great way to get connected with people and to begin to have conversations about what it looks like to follow the kingdom of God. What does it look like to invite God's presence and instruction into our life? And then just generally speaking, as we're in this really strange time, tense, um, people are at each other's throats, it's not a really great time. What does it look like to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what does it look like to show up in my workplace, in my community, in my neighborhood, with my family? Where are you at in this, and how do I reflect your kingdom and your goodness in this location that I'm in? God promises the abundant life, and he promises that when we meet with him, um, good things come out, life comes out. The world is going to promise us a million shortcuts. It's going to tell us the only way to get ahead is to take care of myself first. 
And what God is asking us to do is to lay down those shortcuts, lay down those bad strategies, and to trust Him first. So I want to pray for us. Um, Lord, we just thank you that your word is so good and it is filled with such rich truth and rich instruction. And I pray that you would open our eyes and ears, that we would see you for who you are, that we would read your word properly, that we would understand what it is you call us to and how you're instructing us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage us where we need some courage and we need some strength and faith. I pray that you convict us uh, when our hearts are hard and we aren't really interested in doing it your way, I pray that you correct that in us. And I do pray, Lord, that we would look more like you, that it would matter that we're here and that we would be part of bringing your kingdom um, into this world and that it would be a, a kingdom of joy and a kingdom of peace and a kingdom of hope. So Lord, will you just unite us um, in ways that we can't right now because we can't be together? Will you instruct us um, because you can do that through your Holy Spirit. And will you bring your goodness into our community and into this church? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Because you don't withhold your love from us. Your arms open wide upon the cross. You give no matter what the cost Jesus we see All of these worlds in your hands have made A billion stars stretch out in space These are just echoes of Your mercy overflows, your blessing is a river, on and on and on it goes. You are an endless fountain, you're filling up my life. My heart will sing your praise, Jesus, you be
Well, I'd love to encourage us this week to spend some time meditating and slowly reading through the Sermon on the Mount. Let the words permeate your soul. Let them shape and form us. Let's be prayerfully reading through what the blessed life according to Jesus really truly looks like. In a moment, there's going to be an opportunity to give on a slide that's going to come up. Before that, I'd love to pray a blessing over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and fill you with his peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Victory. 